Okay. All right. Let's officially get started. We're going to talk about today um, brokerage and the law of agency uh, and what we're going to cover. We have a lot of slides to cover tonight, so we're going to try to move quickly as quickly as we can. Uh, if you've taken this, taken any of the other courses, if you've been with me since day one, again, more refresher, more refresher. Okay. Uh, if you haven't taken it. This is going to end up being new to you, um, but I can assure you that you will hear this in other courses. Okay. So, in this situation tonight, we're going to explain the types of agencies and the processes by which agency can be created and terminated. We're also going to describe the agent's duty to a principal, a principal's duty to an agent, and an agent's duties to customers, as well as a broker's duties. Uh, related to what we call the minimum service standards. We also have to identify the broker's role in the disclosure of agency relationships and the types of agency relationships and agency responsibilities uh, that are created by Texas statute. We're further going to distinguish the employees from independent contractors and explain why the distinction is important, list the requirements for broker compensation, and the situations in which a broker would or would not be entitled to a commission. We'll further describe the various types of antitrust violations that are common in the real estate industry and explain the provisions of the DTPA and its act applicability uh, to actions of the real estate agents. So again, we've talked about this and if you've not taken law of agencies, this is going to be brand new to you. If you have taken law of agencies, this is pretty simple for you. It's a refresher, okay? Um, so in this situation, the things that we're going to be discussing is going to be agency, agent, sub-agent, principal, fiduciary, client, customer, and minimum service standards, okay? So throughout tonight, we're going to be talking about those terms. So you do need to be aware of those different terminologies, okay? Now, to get started, we need to talk about either general agent versus special agent, okay? So Mr. Uh, Travis, he is a real estate agent with me. He, I'm his broker, he's my real estate agent. So me and Mr. Travis, do we have sir, a general or special agency relationship? It's gonna be a general because of the fact of the matter is can you sign me to a contract do you want me into a contract yeah yeah so in this particular situation when you're sponsored by a broker a real estate broker and the real estate agent is going to have this general relationship okay this general agency relationship so in these situations as it allows travis to have a very broad basically spectrum in regards to what he can do um for on my behalf. Okay, so it represents the principal in a broad range of matters that are related to a particular business or activity. Now a special agency is going to be something where it's for a particular, normally a one um, type of transaction matter. So Miss Linda, you hire, uh, say Miss Leela to sell your house for you. Miss Leela and you have a special agency relationship because Miss Leela only has one job and that is to sell your house. Okay. So when you are selling a property, you are a special agent. You're not a general agent because you don't want Miss Leela signing checks on you or binding you to contracts or things like that. Miss Leela has just a job of selling your property. Okay. So a special agent, it's authorized to represent the principal in one specific act or business transaction under very detailed instructions. Okay, so those are going to be your difference. General is going to be very broad. Special is going to end up in the situation it is not going to be as broad. Okay, so very key in these particular situations. In regards to the creation of agency, okay, there is expressed, implied, and agency by ratification. Okay. Expressed agency is what, Miss Linda? 
express this means that you, you recognize them? Expressed is actually written or said verbally to somebody. You actually tell me something or you state something. When you do that, it is expressed. Okay? So in that situation, we have to make certain that uh, in that particular situation, we have to make certain that the express agency is going to end up in this particular situation uh, that we have to ensure that it's actually stated. Okay? So in this particular situation, we've got to make certain that the express agency is actually going to be stated. All right? Um, now, in an implied agency, implied agency is by the actions. Okay? So an implied agency is through your actions. So my question in this particular situation is, Miss Linda, could I possibly create an agency relationship by my actions? How could, how, give me an example of how that could happen. Um. I went like implied for example if Travis comes out and meets you at a property and shows you some listings so he shows you a property could you possibly get the assumption that Travis is your agent yes would that be through express or implied implied why because he had paper and documentation showing no I don't no. say he oh, just showed up oh, you yeah. and open the house and start showing yeah. you Yes. So what about it though? What's the problem? What's the process about that? If he goes in and he starts showing you property, can there be an implied agency? <coughs> my man. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes, she can. Yes, but no, but my yes she can. What it comes back to is the situation is implied is by him coming out there, opening the door, start showing you a property, you start looking through it start asking him questions he starts answering those questions and continually goes through the process of showing you other houses it's implied through his actions through his actions of him walking around showing you properties and all you may have never wrote down or, or spoke it but through him continually showing you properties could be agency it doesn't always have to that's why i tell agents all the time it's best to get it in writing than just letting it be assumed. Okay? I would rather get, if I'm gonna have an agency, I may go out there and show a property. I may end up in this particular situation, I may show a property. But if I'm gonna end up showing a property, what's gonna end up in this particular situation is this, is that I need to make certain that it's clear to my person that they understand what relationship we have, okay? So we need to make certain that we are stating things properly. In regards to agency by ratification, you can ratify a contract that may not actually be in writing. The worst thing you can do is think about it from this situation. Let's put it more into everyday life here, okay? So in a particular situation, uh, we go over in this particular situation Mr. Uh, Gross, I mean, not Mr. Uh, Stahl, you go out, sir, and you lend to Mr. Eugene a hundred dollars. Give him a hundred bucks. So Mr. Eugene got a hundred dollars from you, Mr. Uh, Stahl, and then he just goes about his merry little way. Okay. Then you down the road, say two weeks down the road, Mr. Eugene hasn't paid you back. You just are under the assumption that he is going to pay you back. And you sue Mr. Eugene to say that he owes you money. And you want interest and you want damages and all this stuff from him. So you want $300 back. Okay? Well, here's the thing here. Okay? Mr. Eugene and Mr. Stahl, what's the problem here? It's now left up to whose decision to decide what type of contract you get. A third party judge that has no idea what happens. Okay. Do you want a third party to determine how payment's going to be made? 
No. So it's best to do what? It's best if Travis is going to give you $100, what should Travis say? Hey, here's you $100. You're going to pay me back in two weeks at 10% interest. Because what could happen is the judge could go one or two ways, couldn't they? The judge is either going to side with Travis or the judge is going to side with Eugene. So, but there is no common ground. It's either going to be one or the other. Okay. So, Mr. Stahl may get all his money that he wants, or he may have spent a thousand or two thousand dollars and lose it plus his hundred dollars because he lost the court case. The judge was for Mr. Eugene. So, in these situations, you have to be very careful. That's why I tell people all the time: is you don't work for free. You don't work for free. Okay. You don't in that situation. You don't end up working for free. That is the key point. Okay. Now, how do we terminate these contracts? How do we actually end up terminating? Well, there's a list of them, okay? Of course, termination can be direct, okay? I can end up in some situations, I can tell Mr. Eugene, Mr. Eugene, um, I no longer want your services. Thank you, sir. And I walk away, okay? There can be, same thing with termination, falls down here under mutual agreement. It can end up where me and Mr. Eugene mutually consent to the termination. Okay. If either party dies, the relationship falls apart. But hold on here, hold on. What if Mr. Grossman is a real estate agent of mine, I'm the broker, and Mr. Grossman dies? Is the relationship dead? Is the agency yeah. dead? No. Why? Because you are the part. I'm the, the broker. Part. As long as I'm still alive, the agency on. still continues. Sorry, Stefan. But if I die, what happens to every contract my agents has done? They all null and void. Null and void. They're dead. Okay. Until you find another broker. Okay. Until somebody comes to take your place. Right. Now, unless another individual, another broker steps in. There's one right there. He said he's got it. Okay. So, in that particular situation, death. Oh, Brian, now, does, it, oh, does it have to be death? What's no. another way? It could be they Incapacitated. Yeah. I could end up, I could one day just lose my mind. In that situation, <laughs> Poor Miss Leela will have to take care of me if I lose my mind, but my entire business will go down. Okay? She'll have to she'll have to be my counselor for me. So she told me she works for free if I need it though. That's oh, what she, that's what she told me. You uh, know what? I think you already started losing your mind talking about free. <laughs> <laughs> the problem already. She said it's already happened. You already lost it. <laughs> <laughs> so but yeah, it can. You you end up with that situation. You, you can become incapacitated. And if you become incapacitated, either party, that contract's done. Um, if the property itself actually is destroyed, that's gone. Okay. If the contract expires, if it's expired, it's gone. Another thing I want to explain something to you about expiration for those of you that are new agents and, and even old agents. A lot of times this happens, and I promise you it will happen to you at least once or twice in your life, where we have Mr. Garrett, for example. Mr. Garrett has a contract, we'll say, and he's selling Mr. Keith's property, okay? And Mr. Garrett goes over here and he gets a listing contract, does all the stuff, gets Miss Linda off of his back, gets everything done, okay? And he's waiting to sell Garrett or Keith's property, and next thing we know, after approximately... Uh, a year, Garrett still hasn't sold the property. And his listing is only good for one year. So Garrett just goes over there and notices, oh, my contract, you know, it's it's supposed to end tomorrow. But I'm just going to go on in there and get in the MLS and just be extended out another year. Can't do that. Okay. Why can't he do that, Miss Linda? I mean, he, he already signed the contract with Keith. For one year, the keyword is one year. After but, that one year, you have to have it re-signed. 
But Mr. Keith, but Mr. Keith let him keep selling it. No big deal. No, Mr. Keith's a good guy. He would. No, he won't mind. No, can't do that. Why can't you? Because I'm pan I will hound him until it gets inside. <laughs> That's right. Can't you cannot just hop in there and just say, "Oh, I'm just going to extend it out another year." No. Nope. Thirty days, sixty days. Do no, you can't. Okay, Mr. Keith has a right at the end to have a new contract signed. You don't just voluntarily extend it out another year, okay? Also, when we talk about mutual agreement, can Mr. Grossman, Mr. Grossman, you or uh, you and uh, Mr. Jacob, for example, will say, so you and Mr. Jacob, uh, you're you got the contract signed, okay? Now you're my agent, you signed a contract with Mr. Jacob, so you and Mr. Jacob signed done all this paperwork and whatnot, and uh, you go through here, you've done all this stuff, Mr. Jacobs ended up, he, uh, he signed the contract, and then Mr. Jacobs says, you know, I no longer want to end up, I don't want you or, or your broker to represent me anymore. Okay, I don't want you to, to be my buyer's agent anymore, Stefan. Okay? Can Stefan go ahead and say, sure. That's fine, Mr. Jacob. We mutually agree and terminate this contract. No, no worries, Mr. Jacob. You gotta check with you. Can, can he do that? What did you say? You got to check with you first. You're the broker. But he signed the contract with Mr. Jacob, and he found Mr. Jacob. And, and it don't matter. You're the broker. That's right. He's got to go to you. He's got to take you. A real estate agent can never make an agreement to terminate without broker approval. That happens sometimes. Agents will say, yeah, I had this listing, but I just ended up, I just let it go. Okay? That's not how it works. You're violating your intermediary or your independent contractor agreement. Because everything is supposed to do what? Go to the broker. Now, most brokers, of course, are going to do what, Travis? If you, if a client tells you, I don't want to use your services anymore, what's the most brokers going to say? Terminate it. Sure. Who you cares? Know. Let it go. Yeah. Just let it go. I'd rather have a happy person that leaves, you know, mutually agreeable than angry and upset. You know what I'm saying? So most people are going to let you go, but it still needs broker approval. Broker still needs to approve it. There also, of course, can be what's called renunciation. The broker on its own can withdraw from the matter. I've done it before. I've done it only three times in my life. And it's just because of the fact the person ended up was extremely difficult. More difficult than the one you're thinking about. No way. Yes, sir. And in that situation, I stepped out. I said, I'm done. I withdraw. Find somebody else. Okay. You can do that. The owner can revoke. The owner can revoke. So coming back to the Stefan situation. Where Mr. Jacob tells you, I want to mutually agree to terminate, okay? Well, you have to come to me. Well, Mr. Jacob could just say this. I don't even care what your broker says, Stefan. I'm revoking the contract. I'm out of here. At that point, does Stefan need to even have me involved? No. no. But he, should he, should he still needs to inform the mutual. broker, right. yes. But, but in the situation is the owner can revoke, right. yes. okay? If there's bankruptcy of the owner in that situation, contracts terminate because it goes no longer, if it's bankrupt, it goes to the state or the government for disbursement, okay? Or if we simply complete and fulfill the document, okay? Now, what exactly are the um, duties? Well, the initial duties is care, obedience, accounting loyalty and disclosure that's your duties okay you have duties to take care of your clients take care of the matter to assist them no matter what you have to obey now travis does this mean that if miss leela tells you um you know i want you to go and get this property for me because it's great for growing weed I'm, i want to i want to grow uh have drugs on my property and we can be in business. We can get be in business. Oh, y'all be in business. <laughs> <laughs> the key thing here is those situations you can't obey. Unfortunately, you cannot obey 
even if they mean, even if Mr. Noble says, hey, Travis, you know, me and Leela are going in on this business and we'll give you half of it. You know, if you he'll go, nope, you cannot obey illegal actions. Okay. Accounting, you have a duty. Now, this is not so much the agent. This is the broker. The broker has a duty to account for funds. If a client gives me $2,000, guess what happens? I better be accounting for that $2,000. It better be somewhere in a trust fund. Okay. It does not in any shape or form need to end up going into their personal account. <clears throat> Loyalty. This is a kicker. This is a big one. There will be times in your field, there will be times in this industry that you will deal with very difficult clients. Okay. To the point that you just don't give a crap anymore about it. Okay? You just wanna you just wanna get rid of it. You want to be done with it. You have not just your broker that does this, but the government, the law says you must be loyal to your client, even if they are a pain in the neck. Okay? Now does this mean, let me come back to you, Travis, because you are licensed as well. I'm going to ask you this question. Say that I am representing, um, let's see here. Say that I am representing Mr. Colton. Okay, I'm representing Mr. Colton. And Mr. Colton, God forbid, he, he calls me every hour on the hour constantly checking in, wondering what's going on, why haven't I done this, you know, constantly texting me every five minutes, nonstop, just blowing my phone up, nonstop. He's annoying the you-know-what out of me right now, okay? Can I just do this if you have a listing? Can I do this? Hey, uh, Travis, I just want to be honest with you, man. This guy, God, this, this guy, my client, his name's Colton. Colton Ledbetter, Jesus Christ, he's a he's a pain in the you know what. I mean, God, Lee, he you want to talk about most annoying person in the world? It's Colton, okay? Like, you know, dude, like, what what can we do? I don't care. I just want the guy off of, out of my hair. Can I, can, can, what can we work out? Let's just make because this guy, this, his name's Colton Ledbetter. <laughs> what what's can, can I do that? No. Why can't I do that? You're disclosing information. You're not being loyal to your you're not being loyal to your client and you're also disclosing information you should Exactly. I am. I have a client that's really annoying. <laughs> is, that, is that Linda Nobles? <laughs> you better not say anything because I'm not looking back this time. But, <laughs> I, I know. I got eyes behind my head. I'm, but, back here too. I'm, I'm busy. I'm working on <laughs> But the thing is, is no, you can't do that. You can't. You, you cannot say negative things about your client to other agents. Okay. You can say something to the extent of, I definitely earned my money on this transaction. And if you say that, what do you, what are y'all assuming right there? What, when I said that, what's that mean, Ms. Eugene? I went through hell. Just that word. But if I go in and I spill the beans and say, you know, this this guy just drives me nuts and da 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 da, da that's not being loyal. That's not loyal. Loyalty is where no matter what crap they put you through, you stick through it. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, no matter crap they go through, you still stick by their side. Okay, that's your job as an agent. Okay, disclosure. You have to disclose things that you know. Mr. Eugene, if, uh, if Mr. Keith ends up, you're representing Mr. Keith, and you find out certain things, and you're like, oh, crap. If I tell Mr. Keith this, he's going to lose it. I'm not going to tell Mr. Keith. I'll keep that hush hush. Nope. You can't do that. You have to disclose the good and the bad, period. Mr. Grossman knows exactly what I'm talking about on that one. 
But there's times you get bad news and you're like, oh, this is going to be, you know what? I don't even want to make that call. Yep. That's normally what it is, but it's part of the job. Okay. The next one in regards to what the principal, that's the, the seller, the owner, the buyer, the tenant, what they own to you as an agent. Okay. They have to pay you. They got to pay you. They also have to provide the information when you need it. They also cannot hold you personally liable for actions that they caused. Now, if you're negligent and you're up for it, okay, but they cannot hold you responsible for their neglect, okay? And the last one, <laughs> you probably think this would be the easiest one, but it's not. They have to be available. They have to be available. They have to work with you. I've had this before with the client. I said, okay, Miss So-and-so, I need you to be available to me, okay, when I need to show the property. Yeah, 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 I'll be, I'll be available. I'll be available. Okay, great, great. Next thing we know, we go over here and I tell her, I said, uh, hey, Miss, uh, we'll just play, play it out with Miss Linda here. Hey, Miss Linda, um, I have somebody, uh, Mr. Grossman, he's another agent. He wants to show your house. Uh, he would like to show it in four hours. Oh, that's just not going to work for me. Uh, it's just not going to work. I, how about tomorrow? Okay, well, let me see. Call Mr. Grossman. Mr. Grossman says, yeah, we probably can make that work. Okay, okay, sounds good. Well, tomorrow, Miss Linda, at 12 o'clock, he'll be out there. Okay, everybody's happy. Okay? So, Mr. Grossman goes over here. He's, he's good, and we're here. Well, then, next thing I know, at 9 o'clock in the morning, guess what I get? Phone call. Uh, you know what, Justin, I just, I, I'm so tired and, you know, it's just been so, I, I'm just, we're just going to have to cancel and reschedule it. Oh, well, Miss Linda, you know, we just did, well, I know, I know, let's, let's just, let's push it to five o'clock tonight. Oh, okay, Miss Linda. So I call Steph, hey, they can't do 12, can we do five? Yeah, 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 five will work. So then it's two o'clock in the afternoon, Miss Linda calls again. I, I can't make five o'clock just I, I just it's just not gonna work. Can, can we do tomorrow at, at noon? Yeah, been through that. Okay. Eventually what happens, Mr. Grossman? If I call you a third time, what's prop what's gonna happen? You still wanna go show that property? No, well, not really. Yeah, you gonna, what are you gonna tell your clients? Don't even waste your time with it. This woman don't know what she's wanting to do. Okay? That's what ends up happening, is that in this situation, they have to be available. I had one client, she put her house on the, on the market. She put her house on the market. And I said, actually one of my agents said, called her and said, hey, we'd like to end up doing an open house on your property. No, 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 I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna open house. People, people come in my house and you know, they might be bring germs. Okay. All right. Well, you know, we can have them wear gloves and masks and, you know, everything. And we, we can disinfect the property before and after. We can help you. You know, we want to, no, 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 no. I don't want people walking around in my house. Well, can they walk around on the yard? No, no, I don't. They can see it on online. They can see the pictures. What's the problem with that? Because pictures can be pictures out. can be very deceitful, mm -hmm. very deceitful. Okay, your client has to be available. They have to be willing to let you show the property. The duties of the agent to a customer. The difference, Mister uh, Stall, between a customer and a client is what, sir? Uh, if you have representation. If I have a duty, a legal duty to them, then I have uh, their client to me. But if I have no duty, it's just somebody walking around just being nosy, like a person in like a window shopper in Target or Walmart, then in that particular situation, they're just a customer. Okay. So to a customer, 
You only owe reasonable care and skill. Okay? You also must be honest and fair in your dealing with them. And you must disclose material facts. Now, I want to explain some stuff thing right here in the middle about puffing, misrepresentation, and fraud. No, I'm not talking when I say puffing. I'm not talking about what Stefan does with that bait deal. Okay? Oh, my God. That's not what we're talking about. Okay? We're talking about what? Okay? What are we talking about, Steph? Do you remember what puffing is? That's like over, over, you know, selling a property or something. It's basically, like you said, it's selling. It's, it's over hyping it. Yeah, it's, it's hyping it up. So I may say something to the matter as simply as this. I may say, Mr. Eugene, this house has the most beautiful view from the backyard. Yes. Well, what did you say the other day, Mr. Grossman? It's the eye of the what? Uh, the eye of the beholder. The beholder. We had one that ended up never talk about the anything in regards to, to the names or properties or things of like that, but we once a long time ago, we had somebody that went into a property and they ended up the property was in horrible condition. Horrible. And the client was like, oh my God, this is the most beautiful house I've ever seen. Well, everybody has their own views. Okay. Everybody has their own thoughts. Okay. You've got to make certain though, when you're using puffing, that puffing don't lead you to misrepresentation or fraud. Okay. So in that situation, make certain that, that it does not end up it does not lead to misrepresentation or fraud, okay? For example, you cannot say that this water has the best water in the entire United States. Why is that? Well, can you test the water to see if it actually has the best water in the United States? Yeah, you can. You actually can test it. You can. Okay, it's a trick question, but yes, you can. But can you test views? Could I say, Travis, right now, out our window here, could I say, we have the best view in Bryan Colic Station? If you want to say that. If I wanted to say that, I could. But to you, you may be like, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> right? So in that particular situation is, you got to watch it from what you're saying. If it's something that is an opinion, that's fine. Okay? If it is an opinion, that's fine. But if it ends up, if it's actually something that you can end up, you can measure, like water or things to that nature, then in that particular situation, what ends up happening is, is you can end up, you can go over there and you can turn around. And I'm sorry, everybody. I'm, I'm messing with a friend of mine up here. He's, uh, he's walking out and I'm putting my little laser out there. <laughs> he's got a chainsaw. Watch out. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, but in that particular situation, what it comes down to is, is that you got to make certain that as you go through this, that you do have the proper way of how you say things, okay? The views, those are things that are an opinion. I could put every one of us in this room right now, and we all look out this window, every one of us, and what's going to end up happening? Some will say, man, I like the natural view. And some will say, I don't like it. It's a great view of the parking lot. Yeah, it's a great view of a parking lot. Okay. But the thing is, is that it depends. So again, it comes into what it is. But when you start saying that this place has the best soil in the entire United States, can you measure that? Yeah. Yes, you can. So you have to be very careful that your puffing does not lead to misrepresentation or fraud. Okay, you got to be very careful in those situations. Now, there can also be what we call latent defects. Okay, latent defects in this situation, which you have to make certain of, is that as you're going through these, that you do understand that these are what we call hidden 
structural defects, okay, that would not be discovered by an ordinary inspection, okay? So in this particular situation, what you have to make certain of is you gotta make certain by all means that as you're going through this, that can you, let me ask you, Mr. Eugene, this wall right here, okay? Can you see behind this wall, sir? Why can't you see behind this wall? I thought that's what every human being could do. You don't have x-ray vision. Well, Travis, I know you do. What structural issues are wrong behind this wall, sir? There's plenty. Oh, you see plenty back here? where there shouldn't be, and the wire is everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in this situation, latent defects are things that are actually hidden behind things that cannot be easily solved. Just like if we were to take this wall right here, the exterior wall, well, the exterior has brick, the interior has this basically sheetrock. Can you see between that? No. Okay. So there may be certain hidden structural issues that may not be discovered until what? Until after the fact. It's just like when you buy a brand new car or buy a used car, it may be running perfectly fine. And then you drive it off the lot, and what happens? Boom, there goes the motor. Okay? In that particular situation, you're pretty much screwed. Okay? So, again, that's why you want to make certain that they are looking at these things. There, of course, we talked about stigmatized properties. What's stigmatized, Mr. Grossman? On it or criminal activity or maybe it's basically there's something that happened there, maybe a murder-suicide. There's a lot of things. So it's properties that are branded as undesirable because of the actual or rumored criminal, the key word there is rumor, rumored, because some people can make up things, okay? I remember when I was young, we used to ride bicycles and there was always a house. Everybody said, oh, my mama told me that, that that's a ghost house. There's ghosts in that house. Well, it's rumors. Okay, they can do that. If there's tragic or scandalous <coughs> events that occurred on the property too. If it if Miss Linda was telling everybody around that Garrett's house, that Garrett makes meth, and she gets that around town, what happens? It could be a rumored false statement that has now ended up stigmatized his property. I would not do that for Garrett. So in these situations, we gotta be careful, okay? There are certain disclosure requirements, okay? There are certain disclosure requirements. So there is, of course, the agency statutes, the seller agency, as well as sub-agency and buyer agency, intermediary agency, and undisclosed dual agency, all right? Now, of course, seller and sub-agency basically is working on the behalf of the seller, while a buyer's agent is going to be working on behalf of the buyer, and an intermediary is where one broker is representing both parties, but not physically representing them, okay? So they would be, the broker would appoint a license holder to those individuals. Now, an undisclosed dual agency in this particular situation is where we end up, we have to make certain that the relationship is going to be not fully disclosed. We're representing the parties without actually fully disclosing it, okay? So in a single agency, you have a seller client and that client retains a seller broker. In a buyer client, they represent a buyer broker. If you notice, the lines go directly down, okay? In a sub-agency, the seller represents or purchases, not purchases, but hires a listing broker. Said listing broker works with a selling broker that procures a buyer, okay? In intermediary, the seller and the buyer both utilize an intermediary broker. And with an intermediary with appointments, this is where the seller has an appointed license holder. This individual then is basically, so it'd be like the seller, then I have Stefan on the appointed agent, buyer, I put Travis over here, and then down at the bottom is myself. 
Okay, that's an appoint. That's with appointments. Now let me go back here. With this type of agency, with this type of intermediary, if there is no appointments, Mr. Grossman, can I right here as the intermediary broker? Can I give this person or this person advice? No, you can't really say anything. What do I? What am I basically if I'm in this this type of agency? Just a middleman, a paper pusher. I'm a glorified, very highly paid paper pusher. You give me your contract, I give it to the other, and back and forth, back and forth. But I can't give either party advice. So, Miss Eugene, Miss Mister, and this is Eugene. Question: If I'm a broker, okay, and you end up, y'all hire me. So. Mr. Eugene, we'll say you're the seller. Miss Linda, you're the buyer. Miss uh, Mr. Eugene, question for you, sir, is can you, sir, end up, can I, or do you want to pay, do y'all want to pay me, basically it's not even Miss Linda, but you, Mr. Eugene, as the seller, do you want to pay me 6% of your property for me just basically to say I can't give you any advice? Not really. All I do is I just draft the paperwork, Mr. Eugene, that's all I do. Now I'm gonna get six percent, sir. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I don't like that like either. Okay. So in that situation, you do have this type of relationship. Okay. Now in this situation, are you gonna get advice? Oh, yeah. yeah. Because why? Because I, I appointed you. You're appointed to Mr. Grossman. So Mr. Grossman, can you give your client advice? <laughs> Mr. Travis, can you give Miss Linda advice? Because what am I now here? I'm basically going to put a wall between those two where Travis and Stefan cannot talk other than negotiations that I'm going to be sitting in on to make certain there is no disclosure of information. I take that very seriously as a broker. Now, do all brokers take it seriously? No, but most do. Okay. Now, what about this broker sales agent relationship? So this is where you kind of want to peek up here in just a minute. Actually, let's take, just give me a, a quick little second. Mr. Grossman, can you pause it for just a second for me, please? Okay, so in this particular situation, this is where when you become a real estate agent, you pass your exam, you're going to have a broker sales agent relationship. Okay, you're going to have that relationship. Now, Real estate sales agent is going to be able to license to perform certain real estate activities on behalf of a licensed real estate broker. Now, as a broker, I can dictate what my agents can and cannot do. I could tell my agents that none of you can do any, y'all can't represent any sellers. All we do is buyers. I can dictate that. Okay. I can dictate a lot of different things in our contract. All right. So when you go looking for brokers, one of the key things that you need to look at is, is what are my actually, what are the activities that I can actually do on behalf of my broker? Because there are some brokers that they are exclusively leasing brokers and that's it. They don't do sales or there are people that just do commercial and they don't do residential. Okay. So in these particular situations are, <clears throat> You've got to make certain that you find out what activities does my broker do. Now, I used to, when I first started real estate, a long time ago, okay, uh, I used to do everything just because money was money and I needed it, okay? But I learned over time, I don't do property management anymore. I refuse to do property management because property management is not worth the headache, the time, nor even the money that you get off of it. Okay. But there are some brokers, that's all they do exclusively, is property management. Okay, and The thing is, is that you have to find out what exactly does your real estate broker do. If I can see that the monies I'm going to make, like I told somebody before, if I can get 100 units and I'm making at least 10% off of each unit, I may get back into property management. But when you're working four or five units and you're only bringing in, if you're lucky, four or $500 a month, but you're dealing with 90% of your time focused on property management and ain't worth it. Okay. So again, you have to be very careful. You have to find out what does your broker deal with? Also broker requirements. The broker is going to have a set of policies and procedures manual. 
They're also going to advise sales agents of their scope of their activity. And unless that scope is limited or revoked, the broker is responsible for all authorized acts of the sales agent. So if I tell, say, Mr. Keith, say he's a new agent, he comes works with me, and I say, Mr. Keith, your scope of work is you can only handle leases. And Mr. Keith starts procuring buyers and sellers, it is my duty to stop Mr. Keith immediately okay, and tell him he cannot do that because that is not part of our agreement. Okay, So in that particular situation, we have to make certain that we are, as a broker, we're watching and assuring that our, our agents are doing what they're supposed to. Okay, A lot of times, people end up, some brokers, don't want to start stuff with their agents because they're worried that they're going to lose money from them. Well, I would rather start stuff with my agents and that agent walk than that agent get me sued for three to four times. Okay? Rather just get rid of them. All right? Another thing you need to ask when you're out basically procuring yourself, procuring business um, with uh, finding a broker, and you need to find out, am I going to be an employee or am I going to be a contractor? Now, if you are a brand new agent, brand, brand new, you may be thinking to yourself that, my God, I might as well just become an employee of a agent, a successful agent, and just work on behalf of that agent and get paid a salary. Okay? And there are one or two people that I know here in town that they do pay a salary to their their people but now it's not a very hefty salary but it's a salary okay but the thing is is that say for example miss linda say you are a a, a top producing agent and mr grossman wants to come in and work with you you're a real estate agent he's a real estate agent you've got a lot of business mr grossman he has no business he's brand new so you tell Mr. Grossman, I'll pay you $10 an hour, and you're just going to assist me, okay? Well, here's the thing, Miss Linda. At that point, Mr. Grossman has to do what you say at any time and all of that. You set his time and schedule and all of that stuff, okay? He is an employee. However, guess what, Mr. Grossman? As an employee, Miss Linda is still going to want you to do what? Solicit business. She wants you to get sales. So he's going to solicit business. He's still going to do sales. He's still going to do everything that he's already doing right now. But guess what? If you procure a big sale, guess what? The money goes to Miss Linda, not to you, and you don't get a bonus or anything. You just get your paycheck. Hello, Stefan. Love you. How about that? How's that sound, Mr. Travis? Don't that sound just wonderful? You still have to do all the same work but, and give the money away too, Travis. Yeah, that's so awful. Yeah. Yeah. Come on now, Travis. Come on, yeah. Travis. But see, what well, I don't do the work, but still get my salary. Yeah. How long is how long's he going to be employed, Miss Linda? Five, Travis. I have, I, I have a busy ass stuff I'm doing. I promise I'll get there. <laughs> so, yes, that's why. I'm gonna well, see, and that's why I tell people this all the time is, yes, I understand as an employee, it's very difficult. I'm going to be real honest with you. It is very difficult for a person that has worked a job to get into real estate. Yeah, it is. You want to know why? Because their thing is this. It's just like with Mr. Eugene. Mr. Eugene, you get a paycheck every other week. So you work and you get a little money. And you work and you get a little money. Okay. In real estate, guess what happens? You may work your butt off for six months and get no money for six months. And then on the seventh month, you get a $30,000 check. And then you work six months again and you get a $2,000 check. But then there's times that it's so busy that you're closing four or five deals every single month and you're bringing in 20, 30,000, maybe $40,000 a month. So it comes down to this situation is it's very difficult 
for people that are working a job to jump into this full time. But like I've told people this before, if you jumped into this as an independent contractor and you put the exact same time, effort, and everything into it, and I mean you work eight to five, Monday through Friday, like you do your job, and you actually worked, that's the key word, actually worked like you did at yours, and that means door knocking, calling, going to events, joining networking events, doing all these different things. If you do that, you can make whatever amount of money you want. I had one agent that's only been with me for one year, and she herself closed out over $150,000 her first year in real estate. First year. This year, she's almost made that, probably will make that by March or April. And that's not even a net for. Yeah. She will probably end up making three or 400000 this year. This is her second year. But the thing is, is what's she doing? She's working it every day. She treats it like a job. Okay. That's the thing. If you want to sit at home, you want to play. No, no, don't give me, don't give me this wrong. It's fine that you can sit at home because you can work at home. I've done it. Okay. Travis has done it. Stephens and I, we've all done it. Okay. If you are actually working, it doesn't matter where you're at, but you got to actually work is the key thing. The only reason I come up here to the office is because the fact is what? When I'm here, I don't have the distractions of home. Okay? Exactly. When you're at home, what distracts you? You have pets, pets, you got laundry. What'd you say? Your wife. Probably some of the ladies are saying husband. Food. Food. Yes, husband. <laughs> so in that situation, we go through this and we have to understand that you know you have to look at it but if you really and honestly you push hard in this field and you get into it guys and gals i started in real estate 10 years ago almost quit almost quit because i wasn't making no money when i finally started working hard i started actually making a living and over time it ended up it allowed me to get an office it allowed me to get people with me to basically work as a team, to provide them with the tools that they need to be successful. It worked. But what I'm saying is, is you cannot quit in the beginning. That's always my biggest challenge with new agents. They get their license and they're expecting a paycheck. Okay. If you can hold on, you're set. Mr. Stahl will tell you, his first transaction, if I'm correct, Mr. Stahl, your first transaction was basically a year and a few months from your previous job. Yeah. Yeah. So his first commission check was basically his entire year from when he quit and a few months more, he made all in one transaction. And would you say about 30 to 60 days? Yes. Somewhere about 30 to 60 yeah, days. It took me two months to get that check, but I'd rather spend that two months yep. to get that check and then be good. Now, if I, I mean, I can literally, in that logic, make a sale once every year and a half and be okay. So yeah, if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah, if I wanted to. If so, you wanted to retain yeah. that life, that lifestyle, yeah. as they say, for the rest of your life, yeah, you do I one did. or two sales, yeah. you're good. Same thing with Mr. Grossman. What did you tell me with yours? How many months was it with the job you were doing? Uh, about nine months of work. So about nine months of work. He had, he was able to get his. Now, how long did it take you though to get to it? Be honest with them. Well, this this one didn't go very smoothly. It, 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 would, it took a month, more than a month. Yeah, I'd say close to three. Close to, yeah. About three months. Three, three months. So in that situation, what I try to tell people here is this, is that it is not going to be easy. And if you ever want to hear some good stories, Travis, myself, or Stefan can give you some great ones. Okay. Mm -hmm. Even Miss Linda can give you some good ones. But the thing is, is that you have to keep this in the back of your mind. Now understand in broker's compensation, it is owed when, and this is very key, the broker, if you notice, it's not the sales agent, it's the broker, is owed compensation when the contract closes. That's number one. So if the contract closes, broker is entitled to a commission. 
if the broker produces a ready, willing, and able buyer, even if it doesn't close, I'm entitled to a commission. If the broker is the procuring cause, I'm entitled to a commission. Okay, but you as a salesperson are never going to be entitled to that commission. Okay, because it has to go to the broker. Now the agent, and this is where everybody that went to sleep when I was talking a minute ago, this is your challenge to wake back up again, because we're talking about when you're going out there interviewing for a position, okay, the sales agent's compensation is completely different, okay? The amount and the method of compensation is going to be an agreement between the broker and that sales agent. So I could, if I wanted it to, I could have said to all my agents, I'm just going to pay you all a flat salary and y'all are just going to get paid this fixed salary and I get all the money. Okay. So if we make $500,000, I pay y'all 50,000. I'm just walking away with, you know, 450. Well, that may sound like a great idea for me, but a horrible idea for you as an agent. Okay. But there are people that are new agents that they have to have money and they got to have cash and they want to deal. Well, if you're going to do that, you lose out on most of the money. Okay. That's why, because who's taking the risk in that situation? The broker. Okay. If I was to pay all my people a fixed salary and I tell them that they all got to get me money, you know, they all got to do it. Well, they're all going to do the same work they're doing already. They're just not going to get their money. They're only getting little little crumbs of it, okay? So some brokers do end up, they're flat salary. They just give you a flat salary and that's what you get, okay? Another one is the share of commission. That's kind of what I do, okay? I kind of do more of a blended, we'll talk about that in a minute, but a share of commission. So there are some brokers that end up, they take a share or they give, for example, in my brokerage, if you're a brand new agent, I do 50-50 for your first five, because normally the first five, I have to walk you through it. I have to do all the work. So if I have to do all the work, I think I should get half the money, because mostly what's gonna happen, you're just gonna sit there and observe, and I'm gonna be doing the, the work, okay? Yeah, huh? No. So, Miss Linda wants her salary, Mr. Eugene. So she, she, she would like to end up getting her salary, okay? So in the situation is, is that there is share of commission, okay? The next one is what we call 100% commission plan. Now, everybody's like, well, then why do I even need to go to you, Mr. Justin? I just go straight to the 100% 100 here. Okay, well, you go right ahead. Exactly. With a 100% commission plan, they fee you to death. Nobody does this for free. So they will talk about, we give you 100% commission, 100%. Mr. Eugene, 100%, sir, come work with us. So Mr. Eugene's like, heck yeah, I'm getting 100%. Let's do it. But what they don't tell you, Mr. Eugene, is this. Oh, you made copies in the office? Well, that's going to be X amount of dollars. Oh, you actually came in and used one of our desks? That's going to be X amount of dollars. Oh, you took a drink? Okay, that's going to be X amount of dollars. Oh, you went and did that? Oh, that's going to be this, and that's going to be this, and this, 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 this. And next thing you know, at the end of the month, you get a $2,000 bill. Mm -hmm. And you didn't make nothing. Well, you're getting 100% of nothing, but you get $2,000 bill. There you go. That's what I'm saying. So you have to be careful into this. So there are some that do use, and you'll see this last one, it's called graduated commission split. When I first started my brokerage, that's what I did. I did the first five 50-50. After they did their first five, then they moved to 60-40. And then after they did five more, then it went to 70-30. Then it moved to 80-20, 90-10, and 100-0. Okay. And then what happened is once you hit 100 zero, that stayed good for one full year, 365 days, and then you start it back over at 80-20 and had to work your way back up again. Okay? 
Okay? It worked for a while, but it puts way too much burden on me to do that. Because here I was over here, well, okay, okay, Travis just did how many? Okay, Travis did, oh, and Stefan's done this, and okay, well, Travis is here, and Stefan's here, and, and then Travis tells Stefan that he's at 100 zero, and Stefan's already saying, well, I'm at 50 50, and then you get this, it just, it's a mess. It's a mess. Okay? I found the best method that works. I've been with many brokers, spoke with many brokers. I've ended up myself, I've, I've done research on it myself. I've tried it, trial and error in my office. I found it just easy to do this. If you're brand new, it's 50-50 for your first spot, so I can step you through it. After that, it goes 80-20. But the 80-20 is capped at $15,000. So if you end up, you, sp you make $15,000 during your 80-20, then it goes to 100 zero for the remainder of the year. And there's no fees. So I don't fee you, Mr. Eugene, when you're in this 100 zero part because you've already paid me your commissions. So in that time, it's 100 zero to you. Basically, you already know everything. You you've got what you needed. I'm just here to help you on the side. So in that situation, it works. But again, you have to talk to who you're at. See, a lot of people, they just, and I was there too. I was there too when I was an agent. I wanted 100 zero. I signed up with 100 zero. My very, very first broker was 100 zero. Signed up. They signed me into their platform. And guess what? That's all I ever heard from them. Never heard from the broker again. I try to call, no responses. I text, no response, nothing. If I wanted to speak to my broker, it was $150 an hour. Yeah. He charged an hourly rate. For me to speak with him because he was giving 100 percent away so i never could do anything so in that particular situation what i ended up doing was i did this i ended up switch brokers and i was willing to give up any amount of money to learn it because if you can learn it then you could go back to that situation but i will tell you is don't simply just jump because somebody says, oh, it's 100 zero. Or if they tell you, oh, we don't do no monthly fees. Yeah. How, how many of you, uh, if you believe that, how many of y'all want to buy some oceanfront property in Arizona? I'll throw the Golden Gate Bridge in too. Okay? Because that's what it is. We're not in this industry to make no money. Okay? There's always somebody that wants counts or that wants to make some cash. It's going to be some method but you have to be aware of this. Now, what about unlicensed assistants? Say that Mr. Stahl, that your wife wants to help you. Well, what can she do? What exactly can she do? Well, she can perform certain clerical tasks, such as entering the phone, keeping records, and scheduling appointments. Pretty simple, okay? But she cannot engage in any activity for which a license is required. Meaning, Travis, you can't send Miss Elizabeth out to show properties for you because you don't feel like going out today. Miss uh, Mr. Travis, you also cannot have her interview prospects for you. And she cannot control the acceptance or deposit of rent from a resident, uh, a resident of a single family residential property. Meaning that that person cannot end up, even Miss Linda herself, she's not licensed, she that. cannot end up dealing with any monies. It has to end up being that individual agent. That's where it has to be an agent in the office, okay? Because somebody has to do it. Unlicensed assistants cannot do it. Another one that's not sitting up there, right here, it's not there, is you also, Mr. Travis, could not say, you know what, hey, Elizabeth, I'm hosting an open house. You sit on the house while I go put signs out. And if somebody comes in, just let them walk around. You can't do that. They cannot sit on an open house for you. You have to be present through the entire day. Okay. Now, how do we compute commission? Now, you're going to know this because this is actually going to be on your test. So if a property sells for $73,000, and there's 6% commission, 
is going to be split equally between broker H and broker M. The sales agent T is in a 55% commission split with broker M. What exactly does sales agent T make? Well, let's look here. Very top, okay, there's 73,000 times 6%. That gives you $4,380, okay? Now remember, this is to be split in half because the brokers are equally sharing. So both brokers are gonna get $2,190 each, okay? But if you notice, broker H represented the client himself or herself, so there is no split for broker H, but broker M has to do a split. Okay, so in this particular situation, what happens? Well, broker M, there is basically a split. There's $2,190. That $2,190 is split 45 and 55. That's the percentage. So the broker M is going to get $985.50, while the sales agent is going to get $1,200.50. $1,204.50, okay? So out of $4,300, the sales agent is only getting $1,204.50. or 50. Now, hold on here. We're not done yet, okay? Because my agents know this. Who wants their cut out of this, Mr. Travis? Starts with the T. What, the tax people? The tax man or woman. They want their cut. Those tax people want their cash. They want their cut of it. So in this situation, that twelve oh four fifty, okay, has to be normally approximately between twenty to thirty percent goes to the tax man. By the way, most brokers. This is where you got to watch out too when you're interviewing brokers. Who pays for your business cards? Who pays for your signages? Who pays for the lock boxes? Who pays for the marketing? Who pays for all of that stuff? You go to a big, big name broker, you are. You go to an independent broker, most of the time the broker will split it with you or the broker already has it. And the broker will then in that particular situation, they'll pay for it, okay? But the key thing is, is you gotta look out with it. That's one thing that a lot of people when they get the real estate license, they jump to a big company. Now, I'm not saying that all big companies are bad. Do not take what I'm saying they're wrong. What I'm saying, though, is in this situation, is that when you go into a big company, you better have the monies to do it. You better have the monies. That's why one of the things when I set up mine was I said I knew that most people I get are going to be new. And they're going to be like I did when I first started and be broke. They just spent all their money taking the real estate courses. They are going to be broke. They don't have money to buy business cards or signs or lock boxes or marketing. They don't. But if you, if this guy, this salesperson T was with a big company, they might have ended up spent maybe two, three, four hundred dollars on that one listing. And guess what? That's even less money in their pocket. Okay. So you got to be very careful when you're dealing with this. Don't just assume that this is easy. Now let me explain something. Let me add one more little, little, uh, basically issue to this. Now today, because everybody wants to be cheap, a lot of people will say, well, Mr. Stahl, you know, you, you can list my house for 4%, right? Mr. Stahl, right, right. You can go for 4%, you know, three to the buyer's agent, one to one to you, right? Yeah. 1%. Well, what's the problem here? What if this was 4%? Not this. How much money do you think Mr. Ooh. Salesperson T down here is going to have? 180 bucks. Yeah, maybe 180 bucks. He might as well do a lease. Right? So in that situation is you have to make certain that you watch these things. See, a lot of times you go into an interview to somebody and you walk in and what do they do? If you've been into an interview before, Mr. Stahl has, Mr. Grossman has, and probably some of you else that have been in real estate might have already. Okay, they probably go over there and do this to you. You ready? 
They say, well, you know what? Congratulations, Mr. Stahl, for coming in here and meeting with us. You know, we're the number one broker or number two broker or whatever we are. We're the best, and we guarantee that you will end up making a million dollars if you follow our plan. You just have to follow our plan this week. You, you come on in here. How much is the plan? What, the what, huh? How, how much is the plan? Oh, you just come on in. That's the, you just, oh, you just come on yeah, you just come on in. Don't, we don't talk about that money. The money you, you'll be you'll be a millionaire. You got tons of money. You 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 don't worry about that money. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. And then what happens is, you get into this, okay? Or they feed you to that, okay? These are key things that you have to be watching for. Now, am I saying that all big box brokers are bad? No. I am saying that you have to find where you fit in. Where you fit in. You may need a big box broker. You may need somebody to physically hold your hand through every little bitty thing. And if that's what you are and that's your characteristic, you may need it. But if you end up, if you are worried about cost and expenses and trying to learn and have one-on-one -on -one interaction with your broker, then that may not be for you, okay? You have to decide what you need. Now, of course, there is antitrust laws. And what we talked about antitrust laws is number one is price fixing. We cannot as real estate brokers, I cannot sit down with a bunch of real estate brokers and say, all right, all right, all of y'all here that's here tonight, uh, here's what we're gonna do. So that we put out, you know, Travis Stahl's new business, we're all going to only charge 3% or 4% for, you know, six months. Then after that, once he's out of business, we'll jack everything back up. Okay? You can't do that. You can't do that. You cannot price fix. You cannot boycott the competition. I cannot get up here as a broker and tell no broker can do this. No broker can get up here and say, okay, we are not showing any of Eugene Nobles' listings. None. We ain't showing them. Not at all. Miss Linda upset me, so we're not going to show her. We're going to show them all. Okay? Yeah. I can't do that. I can't do that. Okay? I have to in that particular situation. I cannot boycott the competition. Everything is fair. All right? You also cannot do allocation of customers or markets. I cannot do this. I cannot go to say, Mr. Eugene, you're a broker. Mr. Travis, you're a broker. I can't come to each one of you and say, all right, now, Travis, now, Pebble Creek, that's all mine, okay? I don't care what you do, but Pebble Creek's mine. And Mr. Eugene says, well, Miramont's mine, okay? And then Travis says, well, y'all didn't need to stay out of traditions because traditions is mine. We can't allocate we can't allocate customers. We cannot allocate markets. We have to, in the particular situation, we have a duty to end up to make it fair across the board. Okay? If somebody ever tells you, you get out of my market, that's not what they, they can't do that. That's antitrust. Okay? Now, antitrust penalties can range from things as little as a misdemeanor to a felony. And individuals can be sued up to $1 million and up to 10 years in jail, okay? So if you go over there, Miss Linda, and you start some of this stuff, you could personally be sued up to $1 million and possibly 10 years in jail. If you're a corporation, you can be sued up to $100 million, okay? In a civil suit, there is a civil suit, it can be three times the actual damages plus attorney's fees and court costs why we don't play with it. Now we talked about DTPA earlier in uh, law, of contra or law of agencies. DTPA basically is a laundry list of 27 false or misleading acts. The consumer must prove the deceptive act was the producing cause of the damage. Okay. The DTPA basically applies to real estate agents if there is an express misrepresentation of a material fact that is not advice, judgment, or opinion, okay? 
So if you express something that is not advice, judgment, or opinion, you can end up being put underneath DTPA. The information known at the time of the transaction was not disclosed, inducing the consumer into a transaction that he or she would not have entered into. And it's unconscionable action is not advice, judgment, or opinion, okay? The lawsuits under the DTPA must be commenced within two years, okay? And the broker defenses to the DTPA charges is that there must be a reasonable offer of settlement, the written notice to the consumer prior to the sale of reliance on inf or written information from others, and the impossibility of the brokers knowing the information was false or inaccurate, okay? How do they recover from one of these lawsuits? Well, if it's unintentional, then it's gonna be basic economic damages. Whatever happened, it was not intentional, it was unintentional, they're just going to, whatever damages were called or incurred, they're going to pay it. If they know about it, they should have known. It's economic damages plus mental anguish, which can be up to three times whatever the economic damages was. And if it was intentional, both the economic and mental damages can be up to three times. For civil penalties, there can only be $20,000 per violation and up to $250,000 for targeting the elderly, okay? So the DTPA footnotes, the parties to a contract and license holders are protected from liability unless they knew of the positivity or the concealment. The broker is responsible for the sales agent's actions and ENO insurance will not cover that fraud or intentional actions. If you intentionally did something, your ENO policy is not going to cover. Okay, ENO will not cover. So don't think, well, if I did something, you know, my ENO got this. Nope, you know, it's not going to cover for you creating fraud. Okay. So. In that particular situation, I believe, let me check over here for a second. I actually think, yes it is, that is our last slide for this unit, okay? So let me stop the recording.